process to perform, helping you harness your potential on the way to greatness. I'm your host, Mike Wall. Thank you, as always, for listening. If you're enjoying, please subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes, Spotify, and now officially iHeartRadio. We've been putting out videos the last couple of weeks on YouTube, our YouTube channel, Unrivaled Systems, on how to become a better athlete by training through isolation. And, of course, we always have our blog page on unrivaledsystems.com if you want to learn more about kind of our philosophy of what we do. So when my family moved back to California from Florida a couple years back, we had two young kids playing competitive club soccer in Florida, and we were blown away by the amount of talent in Southern California, the youth soccer scene, and obviously San Diego in particular. We were very lucky to find San Diego Football Center, FCFC, which is, I like to call it, a developmental academy that focuses on soccer. It's certainly a differentiated model from anything we had seen prior to focusing not only on technical skill, but also tactical mastery and situational awareness, really focusing on making those decisions, that decision-making process that I always stress on the Process to Perform podcast. They couple that with a lot of work on off-the-field activities, leadership, and community service. So we are very lucky to have Shervin Irfani, the founder of SDFC, and Joao Fernandez, the technical director of SDFC, with us here today to talk a little bit more about the program. Guys, thanks so much for coming on and spending some time. Thank you, Mike, for having us. Really appreciate all your hard work and your involvement in the project. Oh, I, we, my, both my kids are in it. I absolutely love it. Can you, Sherman, can you start by just giving us a quick origin story for the club? Uh, sure. Um, so it, the, originally, it was years ago, I used to drive my son to LA three to four times a week in he, when he was seven years old. And the reason why is because I was very particular about the habits and the training process. <clears throat> and in LA, the only place that I found that had the, that quality that I was looking for, which was a total football philosophy, was a club called Barcelona USA, which has now turned into uh, TFA, Total Football Academy. And um, they were the only ones that they were doing things the right way. And it always bothered me why no one else is interested in what they're doing. Um, And then from there, we had um, a few years later, a gentleman named uh, a gentleman named Jeff Illingworth. He brought in Manchester City to San Diego. And uh, uh, during that time, they had a two week tryout and then they, they selected certain players to go to Man City for a real tryout. And um, to me, that was a real experience taking kids to Europe. And when we went there, what I saw, the level of the training, the quality of the training, the fact that the, co- the engagement of the coaches, the knowledge, and that was at their beginning stages of implementing the total football philosophy. And that's when I realized why here in the U.S. we're so far behind where the European counterparts are. We have the talent here, the quality of the players, but the real coaching was missing. So um, what I did is I started a project with a, another coach, bringing in some of that knowledge to San Diego. However, that coach, I mean, it's, it's tough to work sometimes with egos and philosophies and everybody's right in their own mind. And he wanted to go into a different pathway. And we parted ways uh, after about a year, year and a half. And then um, I still shared my, this vision and I wanted to get things going. And for that, I traveled to uh, Madrid. I met with a gentleman named Guti. He was a coach at Real Madrid. And he showed me a presentation in there. Um, he had a quote from Johan Cruyff. He had a quote from Pep Guardiola. He had a quote from Xavi Hernandez and from Andres Iniesta. So I looked at him and I said, Guti, what gives your uh, Madridista? Why are you giving a quote? Why are your quotes all about uh, FC Barcelona? And he said, look, I am a Madridista, but I can't deny the fact that they're doing something better in player development. This is probably about six, seven, six, seven years ago, this mm-hmm. conversation. And um, so I traveled from there to Barcelona. I was introduced to a gentleman named Jordi Vinales, who was the Barca B head coach at that time. And then through him, they, he introduced me to another gentleman, Emily Ricard and Andres Iniesta. Emily was uh, Andres Iniesta's uh, physio and also his business partner. And um, I shared with all three of these guys our vision, what our goal was. 
and how we wanted to include a youth leadership into into soccer and also teach people life lessons and they really bought into it and that's how we started our initial uh, wave of information that came from there to SDFC and and from there we started to grow we developed the players we brought in coaches from Spain sporadically uh, from specifically from Barcelona these were people that uh, they had certain knowledge of the game and they had little uh, understanding but then our uh, mentors over there were the ones that were providing them with the information and as a part of that process the program developed we evolved and we had a good number of players actually last year about 15 that were called up to the uh, uh, to the US national team camps and we got the uh, the attraction and we got questions from the US national team that what is it that you guys are doing and we explained that and one of the things that they said at that time was why are you guys um, uh, one of the things was that was interesting for them was these players are developing as a group and they're looking amazing but from an individualistic perspective they're missing some pieces and then from there, we, I kind of did some of my research. I met a gentleman named Pepine Linders, who used to be at FC Porto. He was responsible for producing some amazing professionals such as Joao Felix. And he's now at Liverpool, called a friend at Liverpool and put me in touch with Pepine. And uh, Pepine told me that, look, there are, there are four guys that worked with me at FC Porto that understand my philosophy. And one of them was Joao. And he had other um, facets to his knowledge that he'll go through it, such as the tactical periodization with Victor Prad. And I put a gun to his head and brought him here. <laughs> We're all very lucky you did. Joao, do you, do you want to just give us a quick background as well, please? Um, about my career? Yeah, I think everybody would be interested to know. I, I think we all know that you're from SC Porto, but can you just tell us a little bit more about kind of your philosophy there, the philosophy at FC Porto maybe, and, and kind of what made you excited about coming over to Southern California to, uh, to train Americans? Oh, yeah, okay. So, first of all, I want to thank you the, the, the opportunity to talk here. And, and it's a big pleasure to share the ideas and with, with you and Shervin also and talk about a very, very interesting thing that, which is the soccer. So, so I was, I, I worked in FC Porto for um, eight years. Um, my, my career was um, all based in, in, in youth. So I started uh, in a very, very poor clubs with very, very bad conditions. And I was, for example, sharing my salary with another coach uh, just to have the opportunity to 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 coach and to and to learn. Mm -hmm. So uh, I had I started with that basic club and then I I decided to I, I think I was prepared to go to a different level. So I decided to to hit the road and then uh, um, go to Porto. Uh, it was like the, the district and coach another club over there was Salgueiros it was a. It's a very popular club in, in Portugal, but not so high its level. And basically, I was I was paying to train to to be a coach there because they the what they paid me uh, was not enough for the paying for the gas and the the, the, the tolls and etc. Mm -hmm. Was really that was absolutely about the passion about soccer and this is your yourself. education. Yeah, in terms of soccer, I'm I'm just trying to review my my yes. My, Things yeah, no, it. that's what I mean. But this is this is um, you know some some people go to uh, Harvard. You're going to one of the top academies in the world to to learn how to become a better coach. Oh yeah, yeah. So I did a. I think I did a good coach and a good a good job there. And one of my assistants coach uh, was there with me. That not FC Porto, but the, the club uh, before that. He, I was already uh, a teacher. I, I had my career starting, but he was a student. But he was working with me. Uh, but the circumstances of life made me go back to my city, but he, he got a chance to go to Porto, but he didn't forget me. So he recommended me to go to FC Porto and, and be a part of the family. So I believe it was two years after uh, I got the chance to meet some people there and they invited me and then how I started my, my way there. So... Um, FC Porto is is um, 
I think it's a very, very, very unique club. Um, they have a very strong culture. Uh, I, I wouldn't say similar like Barcelona, but I think it's also strong because Barcelona has a really, really deep culture, um, of course, with different characteristics. But also FC Porto is known around the world uh, as a club that has a really strong um, culture too, because we have strong values like ambition, like passion, like rigor. I don't know if that the word mm -hmm. is, is is in English the same. And um, and we have a really we had a really great uh, uh, leadership that that lead the club to the highest level um, in Europe. So, so do you have? Is it mostly? Uh, Portuguese youth, or is it from all over Europe or all over the world? Yeah, we had we had almost were Portuguese players. We had some we had there players from South America. Huh. Uh, we have some Brazilians. We have uh, uh, players from Colombia. Mexico was was a country that we had a lot of players too. And Asian players were not too often. Spanish, I didn't remember anyone. Uh -huh. But was we, we were more like around these 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 zones, uh, the South America, Central America. So we had a players from, and of course Africa. <laughs> of course, okay. Of course, we had a lot of players from there, very talented, and um, yeah, the the level there was was really really high. So we are talking a club that they can pick players, they can select, and they can choose whatever they want uh, accordingly to the uh, club philosophy, of course. And um, yeah, it was a pretty challenging and very demanding environment, and pretty pretty good to to develop as a as a coach. So it actually actually uh, it's not by chance that FC Porto is is also um, a club that is known as a how can I say like a a factory, a plant of coaches, good coaches known around the world. We mm -hmm. have, for example. Luis Castro, right now he was he was uh, youth coaching and youth director in FC Porto. Actually, he worked when I was there too. He was uh, he's right now at the head coach of uh, Shakhtar Donetsk. We have now Pep Pine, for example. He was in F in FC Porto, I believe, for five or four years. He's now assistant coach of club. Uh, recently, we had uh, Vitor Matos that uh, moved from FC Porto to there. We have Vitor Pere Pereira. That won the championship in China is also, and I, I he won the championship in in Greece also. Also, a really good coach. We had uh, Mourinho. We had Andre Villas Boas. He's doing a really great job in France, for example. So I can I can say a list of coaches that uh, from there, and they all all learn about tactical periodization. The the these coaches are doing really well around the world. So what made me move here? I uh, the first thing was I always have the dream to to come here to the United States and I always believe so for what I've seen and and what I was looking in Europe and my 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 context in Portugal my career and etc I always believe that the United States could be a, a a potential country in the world that might have the opportunity to become a, a, a big power in terms mm -hmm. of soccer and I don't. I don't say in short term, but medium long term. I believe that because you have the the sport culture, you have the facilities, you here you have the money, you have the organization, you have everything. Uh, and I knew that you here, um, and I, I verify that there is a lack of something, that, which is the, the coaching. And I believe we're going to talk this after. And this was one point that I was very, very curious. But I have to say that my conversation with Sharon uh, made a lot of uh, it was a game changer, and I the first time I talked with him and he shared me he shared with me the project and the values and what was he was looking for. For me, it was I think it was like instant connection. Okay. I identify myself very quickly what he was looking for, his ideas, and and I I deeply believe that it was the perfect match. And I decided, to, okay, this is this is my 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 opportunity to to go and see, and and I totally identify with the project, and let's 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 go and leave everything and, and let's go and help I, this boy. I love it, and there's a lot to unpack there, but can we can we just talk about as far as what what are you what does SDFC promote? So we promote some things on the field as far as technical and tactical. 
But what do we also promote off the field? And that's really maybe just a question for you, Shervin, because there's a there's a deep seated leadership and community service philosophy there that um, you know, sometimes goes unnoticed at first glance. Uh, Mike, this is a very important point is I'm what you may call a soccer romantic. And I love this game. It's, uh, I, I think it's my greatest passion. And I believe that I, all life lessons are in soccer. Um, and uh, soccer is life, life is soccer. It, it mimics everything that you do. And, and these kids, if we were to be able to take soccer and dissect it and help these kids realize that what they're learning in soccer, these are life lessons that they can apply to everything else that they're doing, um, they will be successful no matter what it is that you're doing. Uh, you learn how to get, uh, how to fall down and get right back up. You know how, how it feels to win, but not to be too cocky about it. You know how uh, we, you learn how to lose and be gracious about it. Uh, to be a, to lose is very different than being a loser. Uh, yes. To lose, it means I lost today. You were better than me. And I'm going to come and shake your hand and then say, thank you very much, Mike. You beat me today. And I'm going to go back home and I'm going to work harder because you just proved to me that I need to work harder. And there is another ceiling that I need to get a breakthrough to go to the next level. And these are the beauties of soccer and understanding that failure is not a bad thing. Most people look at a failure, look at a negative connot uh, from a negative connotation. Whereas failure, it means you just took risks. Being a soccer player where these kids are learning how to be entrepreneurs at their trade because they're taking risks every day. Every action that they're doing, they're taking risks. And we promote that. We tell them, take risks. It's okay to make mistakes. Many times the kids are afraid of um, making mistakes at, uh, at club because, you know, if they're making a mistake during the practice, the coach is going to say, hey, listen, you know what? You're not going to start this weekend because they're making these mistakes. But if you, don't, if, you're, if you don't push yourself outside of your comfort zone, you will never make mistakes, but you'll never grow either. And that's where, that's a big part of it. And then it's our core, uh, core values. Um, you know these things, we, our, our core values are accountability, integrity, community is a very big part of it. Uh, humility, meritocracy, respect. These are things that we need to respect our teachers. We need to respect, and this is something that I think it's missing quite a bit. Teachers are so undervalued in this country, unfortunately. Um, they get paid the least, and they're not appreciated as much. The respect to them is not given. They need to be put on a pedestal. Um, you know, and, and then the same thing goes for the parents. Uh, we teach the kids that you need to thank every parent that's there, mm -hmm. not just your parents, because it's those parents that, were, that brought in their kid. Now you're able to compete and learn from them. So it is a community and we're all connected together. I love how you talk about, you know, one, respecting the game. Two, uh, I've never heard it said quite like that, but we're teaching them how to be entrepreneurs of their trade. I, I, re I really like the way that that sounds uh, because it's really what we are doing. And, and I, I just kind of put together some notes for a podcast on, on, on fear and anxiety and the fear of failure. And there's a quote in, uh, that Michael Jordan had, and it says something to the effect that he's missed 9,000 shots in his life. And 26 times he, was, he had the opportunity to win a game and he, and he lost. And his whole life has been this accumulation of, of failing. And that's why he's been so successful because there's absolutely no doubt in his mind that the next time the ball's going to go in. And that's something that we have to promote and foster as a society, as a club, as a, as a group of parents. And, uh, you know, in that, uh, in that young stage of life, when they're learning all these lessons, that's something that has to be promoted. Absolutely. I, I believe in the power of the mind. I believe in NLP. I've gone through many of uh, Anthony Robbins programs. A good friend of mine is also uh, John Asaraf. And these guys, they work a lot with the power of the mind. And I truly believe in that, is whatever you believe in, whatever you think of, that is your truth. And if a kid or if an individual looks always at the negative, they're always afraid of making mistakes because if I do this, it's going, this thing is going to happen. Listen, life, you have to make, take risks and, and, and make mistakes. If you don't, you will not get anywhere. There is a, uh, one of my favorite authors uh, is uh, Oscar Wilde. And one of my favorite books by him is The Picture of Dorian Gray. 
and there is a gentleman named Larry, and they're sitting at this dinner table. And uh, this lady says, hey, Larry, what's your secret of, what's the secret of staying young all the time? And he tells her, do you remember the mistakes you, you made when you were young? She says, yes. He says, keep making the same mistakes. <laughs> so it's a, it's a part of staying young. It's a, it's a part of, that's what juices us up. And that's what makes life exciting. And again, being an entrepreneur, it's not about money. It's, it's being excited about creating something, taking the road less traveled. And that's what our goal at STFC is, is to teach these kids mm -hmm. how to take that uh, road less traveled. And it's not for everyone, and that's okay. And it doesn't mean one is better than the other. But if that's the road for you to take, perfect, we teach you. The other thing that this game teaches you is how to be a leader, but also how to lead and how to be led. Because within the same moment in a game, one day you might be the leader, the another day another person must be a leader, and you must respect them and you must allow them to become the leader and the superstar in that next game. So, and it could be a momentary thing as well. And that's, those are important in work. Wow, quick one. I mean, we're just talking about people taking leaps and, and, and taking a risk. I mean, coming over to the United States because you see an opportunity is, a, is obviously a very brave thing to do. But I wanna ask you, you, you said coaching, but what, what are the biggest areas of opportunity in the United States? And I mean, specifically, what are the things that we have to overcome here? I always look at soccer in other countries. The closest thing we have here is kind of is basketball, where there's a, there's a basketball court on every corner. You know, you see, go to a city, you see guys playing basketball all the time. What, what is the area of opportunity, specifically with soccer in the United States, that you think that we can really kind of manage the best in the, sh in the short and medium term? I believe that um, the the, uh, the country and uh, the people that made the decisions and they they have to, I, in my opinion, they have to uh, to open the country to the experts the and look what the other countries. I'm not tell, telling about buying what the other countries are doing, but at least learn with them and adjust that learning that knowledge with uh, American culture culture. Mm -hmm. So um, wh what I'm trying to say is like find out the best the best uh, brains in Europe, uh, like United States used to to hire or invite some great great science brains and to come to the country and to, to share the knowledge and and do a lot of things in favor of of uh, United States. Mm -hmm. I think they they should do this, the the same thing about soccer, um, and that that is a. a, a a big wall to be to be overcome. Uh, uh, I know it's very hard, and and United States is not known about his his likelihood of of soccer. They they like the baseball, they like the basketball, like you said, and soccer. I think soccer they are gaining a lot of terrain, and and it shortly will become a very very powerful uh, sport in in United States. So. I believe, for what I've seen, that if um, good coaches from, from uh, with proven results, mm -hmm. with experience, with with I, I I can say talented coaches. I think the United States have to hire talented coaches because United States they have a lot of talent here. I yes. I I've, I've seen with my eyes they have a lot of talent here, and to work with talent, you need to have talented coaches. Mm -hmm. It's like you need money to make to create money. It's like it, this analogy is, is uh, the, the same thing. So, you, you if you have the talent, the talented coaches with, uh, with uh, the knowledge that they bring from Europe, I think that will be a game changer for for uh, uh, a lot of American players. Yeah, that's you know they say that you know <clears throat> I think you you and I may have this conversation, but a lot of American players are kind of the are same or very similar to European counterparts until maybe 14 years old and then something happens and whether that's because we lose interest or whether that's because we don't have maybe what you're saying is we don't have the we don't have the coaching quality to propel those kids that that are that are being pushed at a different level in Europe to kind of keep up and that's and that's probably a reason why many of our our US you know our best US young players now they're going to play for our national team are going overseas but moving back to SDFC, what is the opportunity for a youth soccer player in San Diego playing with an outside academy? I mean, how do you position yourself in the life of an SDFC player who also plays 
for one of the many competitive club soccer teams down there. How, how do you see that relationship, um, not necessarily with the club, but how does, how does the, what does the player take from that that's maybe different than what they're going to get at the club? Um, I, I'll, I'll answer this one because we've had some interesting experiences with that. Um, we've never wanted to be a club because I, I believe, you know, why, why reinvent the wheel? There are plenty of clubs out there that they're, they're doing a wonderful job. And clubs need to focus on developing teams. Clubs cannot focus on developing players. It's just impossibility. And I'm not talking about only here. I'm talking about globally. Um, usually players are sometimes in Europe, they're in, in lower level clubs that they are, their fo pure focus is on the technical technification of players so the players become really good or the top clubs the professional clubs they go and find the talented players so they turn them into a more tactically uh, astute uh, players and this is where the difference actually happens the reason why our players here they all of a sudden they fall behind at that 14 15 age group is a tactical uh, issue it's not a group tactical but it's an individual tactical small group tactical and a big group tactical because technically most of the players here are fairly uh, astute. They're very good. Um, you what mean happens? Technically proficient, Sherman. Very sorry. Yes, uh, technically proficient. But when they when we go to Europe, then all of a sudden that ball moves faster. Then the awareness, the individual tactical aspect of it, it's it's at a higher level once you get to that 14 or 15 age uh, age group. So here what happens is we, that's why we didn't want to become a club. We wanted to be able to be a part of the clubs, an arm that is, um, that is making the job of the club easier. So the club can focus on developing the team. They can focus on the group tactical aspect of it. And we focus on individual player development and we focus on individual tactical aspect of the things. This is where we wanted to really, really focus most importantly. Right. And, and you guys have experienced success in the form of, uh, you mentioned it earlier, there's a, a, a 13 or 14 SDFC players invited, um, not only to national team camps, but now they've, they've gone and they've, they've moved away from home and, and they're playing in MLS academies. Um, your son's playing the Vars Academy in, in Arizona. And we have some kids playing overseas now. So can you talk just a little bit to parents out there about that process and, and maybe, maybe that group specifically, but also what has it taught you about opportunities outside of local club soccer for these aspiring athletes? So one of the most important th uh, things are, are the thought process of the parents. Um, you know, there are, there are parents that their enjoyment out of life is on the weekend to go sit on the sideline and watch their kid um, play soccer. That's their, uh, you know, that's their Sunday game that they're watching, right? And then my son, and I always like to quote uh, Bill Cosby on it, that, and there's a Bill Cosby himself, and he's talking about how his son is in high school and running around, and, you know, he's sitting on the sideline and says, yeah, that's my son, by the way, you know, I used to do the... Uh, all the touchdowns now, I've passed the family business down to him. So it's, it's, it, this is a part of a problem because if a kid, if, if my son's uh, 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 claim to fame is that he won some national championship at the age of 12, 13, or 14, or 15, that's his claim to fame. I will smack him in the back of the head. <laughs> we call that peaking loser. in high school. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, the Al Bundy syndrome. Al Bundy syndrome. Yeah. So, so this is a problem. So that the first thing that we had to do was to change the mindset of the parents, that it is not about winning or losing. You cannot focus on that because it is all about the process of developing the players. The winning is just a byproduct, and it might come down the line, but I could care less. I want the kids to go in there, give everything they have to win for themselves but I would never want them to win for me, the club, the coach, or anyone else, because it shouldn't matter. I would get upset with them if they, if they don't play well. If they don't give all they have, yes, that would bother me. And I had this conversation with uh, 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 two kids that were training today with us, and I told them, I said, look, your father has brought you here. 
Your father didn't say, oh, today I didn't have time or I'm tired and I can't come and bring you to train. But he did. I said, he's sitting under the sun waiting for you guys. And you guys are telling me you're tired or you don't feel good today or you don't feel like training hard today. I said, your dad has brought you here. If you guys really love your dad, you have to get over this and show him your appreciation for what he has done. And I said, and I, and you know, we did, such we a did tough a, lesson, isn't it? Yeah, it, it is. And, and I needed to reset their mind. So we did some breathing exercises. We, we, I believe in motion creates emotion. So, um, we, we did some, uh, emotional, uh, uh, exercises and these kids switched. They were on to the point that dad is, is jumping up and down. Good job. And, and, and so on and so forth. And I told them at the end, I said, listen, you leave the field here. You go hug your dad and you give him a kiss and you tell him, dad, we love you because this man loves you guys so much. That's why he's doing, he's giving everything he has to you guys. And all he wants to see is that you guys are enjoying yourselves and you guys are giving everything you have. That's all he wants to see. And I said, it's unfair of you guys. If he's giving you guys a hundred percent of himself for you guys to give him 90% of you. Of course, of course. Joao, being a part of an academy, and you said that FC Porto had such a good um, talent acquisition team, really. They've really developed a lot. They brought in a lot of good players, and they've developed a lot of good players and coaches. What are the identifying characteristics that catch your eye, both the physical and then also kind of those behavioral characteristics that are non-negotiables in a club like FC Porto? Okay, that, that is a big, big question. Uh -huh. uh, so there is, there is no formula to find a, a talent. And the talent, there is a lot of definitions for that. So let me it, ask you this, Ginger. Out, Eddie, is it more, what is FC Porto looking for for a, for a 10 year old young soccer player? Is it, is it the way that they look the coach in the eye? Is it a physical skill? Is it something mm -hmm. that mentally they see? The field differently is it, is it how they treat their teammates what are those what are those characteristics what are three things that, that every coach you know if they see it on the field they're gonna that name's gonna come up in the in the meeting room i will try to do some introduction about this because i it's a very very critical point here mm -hmm. and because when you pick a when you pick a player you the the impact that you have is huge on his on the family on the player and etc especially when you when you jump for a club like fc porto or that that invite uh, results in moving moving out of your country and etc. So the the first thing uh, 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 we have to understand in FC Porto, we we believe in a bio profile of the player. So we we don't see, we we didn't watch any player that any player that was really good was okay. We want this player. There were some characteristics and some players that have to fit in our culture, in our way, in our uh, philosophy of working the players. So this is the main, main thing for us to, to work on. For example, if our youth levels, our teams, they were more short passing, more uh, possession style, more technical uh, play, more patient style, etc., we wouldn't uh, pick up a player that only thinks about vertical passes, his decisions almost long passes, very fast, very strong, etc. It was like, okay, we might work this player, but what you've seen about him is kind of out of context, you know? Mm -hmm. So this is the, the, the first part that it's very important is about what we are looking for as a, as a player. So our, our body bio profile that fits the club identity, and I'm talking about the FC Porto, I can give an example of Liverpool or Barcelona, and etc. They are picking players that fits their philosophy, mm -hmm. uh, and you can see that off of for the professional team, for example, they they are, they have to 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 scout players that fit their 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 style of playing. So the second thing we we look for is um, the context. This is a very very important thing um, because the players they need the context to express them, them themselves. So it's uh, the, you, you cannot have a player like you see that it might be interesting or very good, and you put the player in a context that is not it's not uh, favorable for him to 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 develop. For example, the the, ex the example of the player that is more physical 
when he plays against very technical players. For, uh, so that maybe that player is going to struggle a little bit. I'm giving this example. I can give another one. So, so the, the context here, you need to predict the situation when you pick a player. We have to be very, very careful about the context where the player goes. And, and this is, works both ways. We're talking about the club that thinks about the context of a player. We analyze the profile, we analyze his, his features, his characteristics, and we want to invite him here. And we believe that the player will develop among the other players and this specific coach. And also the, the parents and the family, they also need to analyze the context because they know the, the kid very deep and they need to understand that this might be a good context for the player to develop. That's very uh, interesting, Jao, because I, I, I think a lot of Americans would assume that you're just everyone's searching for the next Lionel Messi, but it, what you're really looking for is, is a combination of qualities, but very importantly is the fit to that club so that kid has a chance to develop without hampering the development of everybody else you have there. Yeah. I'm talking the highest level. I'm talking about what we were doing in FC Porto. And uh, there is a lot of things you can talk about this because it's a very fascinating thing. And for me, it's very important because there's something that for me concerns me a lot is like everything you do with a player will have an impact on his life. Because you need to, you need your, resp your responsibility, what you say, what you do, your interaction in the player will have a huge impact maybe for the rest of his life. So this is a very, very important thing. The, the players are not numbers. They are persons, they have feelings, they have emotions, they have a, a life. So we need to respect that as a club and as a coach. The other thing is the player's position. So it, this, this is another factor that, that changes the game a little bit. So we need to understand that we might need a, a specific forward for with specific characteristics for that, for, uh, for that age group, for example. Uh, we, we can say that we have a really good right back with these specific characteristics, but we need another right back also a good player with these characteristics. So they are both good, but with different characteristics that the coach, then the coach can, uh, during the season, they can uh, uh, work the team and structure and organize the team in order to explore the, the, the advantages and the, the strongest uh, things that the player has in the team. So this is a, also a factor that we need, to, we need to take into account. So it's very, very important. The other factor is the the scout for me it's very everybody can see a guy a player that passes good with a good dribble etc but a good a good prospection the the guy that identifies the player he needs to understand the game he needs to understand because he can see a lot of a lot of things that the normal eye can see mm -hmm. so the guy that understands the game can understand the, the decision making that the player did in that situation maybe the, the simple move that he does, that guy that understands the game, understands the decision and say that this guy is intelligent. So he didn't do any special move or any YouTube skill that is fantastic so that it, everybody can buy that move and oh, this guy is fantastic. But maybe the situation doesn't require that, that, that type of movement. So a guy that understands the game will see the thing in a different perspective than another guy doesn't understand the game and say, oh, this, oh, he does a really good elasticus. He's very good in scissors. He's really creative. He does a lot, a lot of stuff. So this might create some noise for some people that are not trained for this. And, and it's very, very important to have a person that understands the game in, in different scales. I'm talking about the collective scale and also individual scale. So this is very important. And the last one is the diversity. Like I said about the, the, the position situation when you have two good players with different characteristics. This is very important to have in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in your team group. You need to have players that can complement themselves and you can have a strong, a strong team. And with this, I, I will give an example uh, and taking into account the other, the other factors that I told about the, the bio profile of the player. We want the whole team to be blue. Um, as an example, mm -hmm. but in that blue, we want uh, players that can be light blue. We want the players that can be dark blue. We want the players that can have like uh, blue dots, etc. So different types of blue, but they everybody needs to be in that color. We cannot have a green. We cannot have a, a red. Mm -hmm. It's it, it doesn't match. You, you, you know what I mean? Absolutely. So this diversity. 
is very, very important. And, and, and I have a good friend from, from uh, uh, FC Barcelona. He's also an international scope from them. And I, I really like to talk with him. And he, he, um, he's very, very knowledgeable about these this, this, uh, this, uh, scouting players and the identify the talents and etc. And that's why he's in Barcelona, maybe. <laughs> and um, and yeah, he's 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 sharing some ideas with me, which is really great. And he he also uh, said it that uh, the talent doesn't it, that he doesn't believe, and I also don't don't believe that the, the talent raises by itself. So I'm a talented guy. I know what to do. This so I don't need to practice. I don't need to do anything. So don't worry. I'm gonna sit on the couch and I'm gonna become a professional player. That doesn't happen. That is impossible. Right. So you need. You need to work. You need to have time of practice. You need to have talented coaches to to work you with, and etc. And one thing that Chevin talked um, that I want to ju- just about um, the individual aspect, and that is a very very important thing. And I think the the top clubs in Europe are work, are following that, and we are now seeing a lot of players, youth, very young players, are now having more chances in the A team, and some of them are. are really becoming very, very uh, valuable players with their, their chances. So what I'm trying to say is like the youth levels, the coaches, it's, it's not about the team, it's the, the player development. And the clubs mm-hmm. are, are doing that, 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 that uh, switch. They're, they're the American have, style of hey, win at all costs. Is, is, yeah, we need yeah. to get away from that mindset. Yeah, yes. We have a good, a good example. For example, we have a, like a great, great team. For example, I'm I'm coaching a U19 team. A, we won everything. Was everything amazing? So okay, we you want everything. So let's count how many players will go up to the to the A team. The whole team is gonna move. Is gonna move? That not gonna happen. So <laughs> you have you have to be an individual coach. So you are individual coach, of course, in the team environment. But first of all, you have to be concerned, uh, aware of that. That's and why FC Porto, uh, FC Porto, uh, they called the pro- the project was the the vision six eleven, was like uh, from the two thousand six to two thousand eleven, they they wanted to 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 develop, and that was when uh, Pepin was there too. They wanted to develop players as long as they, they, they could. So they, they prospect a lot of players in, in the country and internationally. They brought him into the academy and they developed there. And then after that project, we saw, for example, John Felix uh, appear. We saw uh, Ruben Neb. So it was uh, after that, with all the talent there, we started to, to go for the, the, the Pepine program that, that he did there. Very, very interesting, very, with a very deep impact in the, in the, in the players. And when I'm talking about individual uh, trainings, I'm not talking about the individual thing, like training by themselves. I'm talking about situations like a small groups and with very, very rich and, and um, as complete as possible game situations in order for them to create situation problems. And they, they were in that, in that complexity in order to, to find solutions. And, and the coaches are there to put them in, into the problem, not give them, how can I say, the solutions. They, the players need to find the answers. And of course, the coach will give them some guidance. Yeah, you're, Sorry you're, about this long. You're, build, you're building that curiosity. And that's one thing that I think we've all talked about many times, coming from Florida, especially when I got here, I was blown away that you were doing something different than just private coaching, that it wasn't just a one-on-one, let's learn some technical skill, because that's really what's going on not only in Southern California, but all across the country. And so what separates, if somebody was to ask me what separates SDFC from everything else we've ever done, it's that you put kids in situational opportunities to perform and then let them try to figure out the way to do it best with, with clear guidance, uh, some technical suggestions, and then obviously a, a very starting to dig into that very deep knowledge base of, of tactical awareness. But yeah. the, the situational small group exercises that we do are, are supremely invaluable and very unique, I think, to the program. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, will, I want to give you an example. I think it's important if you give some examples once in a while. So if you, let's think about an artist. An artist, how, how an artist learn how to do 
amazing and beautiful uh, uh, painting by painting, like doing the thing. So trying and and doing some some draws, whatever. Uh, a piano player, he needs to play piano. Guitar player, he needs to play it. He needs to feel it. So this, that type of uh, thing, that type of time that he invests in practice, it's very, very important. So we don't see the the, pi the pianist doing like strength uh, things in with only with the finger. So he, he, he developed his strength and ability by playing the thing. So this is very important. That makes, that makes complete sense. That makes complete sense. This feels like a good opportunity to take a break. If you're interested in learning more about SDFC, visit sdfc.academy. You can follow them on Instagram at SDFC Academy or on Twitter at SDFC Academy. We will return with the second half of this interview for episode two on Wednesday, May 20th. Until then, I'm Mike Wall. This is Process to Perform. Thank you as always for listening. Have a great weekend. Everybody.